working right into his office. When, when do I start? Any time. Oh. I think basically uh, I began involved, began to get involved on the prompting of my grandparents, who I remember as being so proud of who they were. Unfortunately, here, people began to drift away from the reservation way of life for a number of years because of the work that was, that had to be done in other areas because we are living in an area where there isn't much work. So consequently, for over 35 years, the project of this sort was not done. Indian ha dancing had to be revived based on the knowledge of older people. So I came back to the reservation knowing that something had to be done because we had to create a more positive image to the Indian children about themselves. History depicted Indians in a negative sense. They were either lazy, drunkards, or those people who were just plain lazy. And as a matter of fact, the news, the history books depicted them as savage. So I came back and started to revive the dances with a group of very hesitant young girls and boys. They were laughed at because they were dressed in their regalia, therefore they developed a, an inferiority complex. So we had to start out by giving them positive aspects about their history. Consequently, the day, ceremonial day, is alive and well and participated by 80 and 90 participants who were gladly dressed in their regalia and proudly danced in depicting the positive aspects of history. I was involved in that along with Mary Moore, James Neptune, for about 18 years, and I decided then that I should back off and get some new faces in there and sit along the sidelines and see it live, and it has. But I had another thought in mind that we don't have a museum here to be able to portray the positive history and something that is to be preserved. So I stepped in. I asked the tribal council to, I, well, at least I offered my services, and so did Dave to be able to bring about a museum on our reservation. We've only been at it a little over a year, but I'm surprised at the kind of material, the artifacts, Birch Bark and News, that we have been able to, to have here to portray. And as you can see, there are a lot of photographs here, and I believe photographs tell uh, more than words can can tell. I don't know, that, that kind of, in brief, I could be talking all day. I'm so in love with what I'm doing. That's good. You've donated hours. Why is it so important to you? Our project is kin keeping the generation connection. Why is keeping the generations and keeping this understanding of who you are and where you came from so important? I think it's very important, particularly for us, where, the, where we've been portrayed so negatively. But I think it's equally important to everyone to be able to have a good positive image about themselves and to be able to uh, project that. So I think that, uh, you know, you've got to have a good, good image of yourself. And I think that's true not only with Indians, but with everybody else. And how does, um, how does remembering the past and remembering your parents and your grandparents and traditions, how does that help provide a positive image for a young person? Well, I, my particular case, remembering a positive image, is, is stemmed from my grandparents who, who told me who they were, how proud they were. And I think probably that projects a lot of pride uh, it all depends, I think, on the parents themselves, how they project themselves. 
and it sort of rubs off on children. What do you remember about your own grandparents? What do you remember most? You know, when I looked at the picture of my grandfather and grandmother, and as I remember history portraying Indians as being lazy, I looked at that photograph and I saw so many baskets in front of her that she had handmade. It is a, a work of art. And it had to be a person who was gifted to make such beautiful baskets. My grandfather was a tanner of sealskins who made sealskin belts, moccasins, and so forth. And they traveled from here in the eastern part of Maine to Massachusetts in the years past, in the 20s. And they would go to the fairs and sell their wares, come back, and that was their existence with the tough winters that we faced here in this area. And at the same time, they were proud of the fact that they were Indian. They were dressed in their regalia. And I think there's a spark of that left with me, and I want to generate that to all. Tell me the story you were telling about the, um, the gentleman up there who was in the battle here at Machias. Well, I guess probably before that we have photographs of the Indian participation in all of the wars, World War I, uh, World War II, Korean-Vietnam conflict. They participated gladly because in World War I and II, there weren't any Indians drafted. They volunteered willingly and served their country. And in the Revolutionary War, there was an Indian, Passamaquoddy Indian chief by the name of Neptune. He shot the British officer off the bridge of a ship and saved the eastern part of the United States, for United States, in the Battle of Machias. And, and therefore, it was uh, with deep pride that we want to point that out. We have about 45 to 50 patriots who died in that Revolutionary War. But what is amazing is that in spite of all their war records, they were not allowed, we were not allowed to vote in the state of Maine until the mid-1950s, and we didn't have the right to vote until about the 60s, even though we were citizens, declared citizens, in 1924. And it amazes a lot of, particularly the teachers that come here and take a tour. It astonishes them to, to know that kind of fact, but it is a fact, and that's what we're revealing. Tell me about your own children and your own grandchildren. Um, you said that you feel that they may have started to pick up on your effort. I'm very hopeful that they have, and I think they have. Uh, we want to infuse that at an early age. And I think that holds true for every parent to be able to do that in the home. That's when it becomes very important. I do that, and I believe my grandchildren, uh, you know, have some uh, pride in their heritage. But I encourage parents, particularly the parents, to do that. Um, Dave Francis, who is a my linguist here, a self-taught linguist, he and I have contributed many hours together. We've developed several books in the areas of language. And if language and the other customs are not practiced at home, it certainly won't be the fault of Joe Nicholas or David Francis. So I'm hoping that we will convey the message as it should be. Talking in more general terms about grandparents' relationships with grandchildren, you must see grandparents who are what you'd call successful grandparents and grandparents who are call, what you would call not as successful grandparents. Thinking of those grandparents who are successful grandparents who have what you'd call a good relationship with their grandchildren, what do you think they do? How, what is it that makes them good grandparents? 
I think what really makes them good grandparents is creating a good example of themselves, which I try. Uh, definitely, there are mistakes, but I think that mistakes can be rectified uh, by using an erasure. You know, the pencil manufacturers put out a pencil with an eraser on it for a purpose. But I think if everybody sits down and say, my grandfather or my grandparents are old, they don't know what they're talking about. But on the other hand, as we grow older, we grow in deeper respect, knowing as we grow older, we, we grow with wisdom and really understand our grandparents to be one of the greatest teachers. But at a certain age, it's unfortunate we don't listen. Looking back on your relationship with your grandparents, what, what type of relationship was that at the time? I think it was very happy. My grandparents never had too much. They worked and scraped for a living. But they were very, very sharing people. They shared what they had. And that was the, the community here as a whole. Everyone respected everyone else. And I think I marvel at a lot of the older people, not only my grandparents. I marvel at all of the elderly people in the years past. We look up to them with deep pride because they were the very unselfish people. They shared and they respected. And these really are the true Indian traits. If there's one thing that you could leave your grandchildren with, and I, I don't mean a material thing, if there's just something you could leave them with, what do you want them to most remember about you as a person? I believe I would like to have them remember me as a person who tried to instill with them just pride in themselves and to have respect for everyone and everything around them and to be able to someday meet people who don't have a smile is to be able to have them give it to them. I think those are the kind of things that we want to leave. We want to be able to leave the message of my grandchildren to become independent and as I mentioned before, the respect. To be independent, to make the whole world a place of opportunity and a place to make a living. But at the same time, keeping in mind they are who they are and being proud. What do you feel is the most valuable thing that your grandchildren give to you? I think one of the most important things is the fact that they are born when I can really enjoy them. That was great, Lee Okay. Well, my grandparents are, are grandparents that I shall never forget. They're in my memory and hopefully that they will spark in my memory the kind of life that they had, and I hope I'll be able to portray that. Same kind of uh, attitudes uh, to my own grandchildren. I'd like to make a, just one remark of, it wasn't my grandfather who told me this, but it was a man who had great, whom I have great respect for. And he told me one time, he said, always give your children and your grandchildren everything that they need. He said, but don't ever give them what they want. He said, because if you give in to the wants, you will destroy the most important thing that they have, is that their character. And we don't want to destroy that. Instead, we give them love and understanding. Time doing it. I'd just like you to talk about that for a minute. Well, I believe that uh, I have some deep-rooted pride emanating from my ancestors before me. 
and I want to be able to instill that to the future generations because I am an Indian from within and I love who I am and I like to project that to others that I can confront with. Not in the sense that I have a chip on my shoulder no, because I am an Indian. It, no, it's because I have some positive aspects that I've learned from my grandparents and I want to project those with respect. Perfect. Now I understand that you're involved with the language part of this program and that you're teaching the um, language to adults. Tell me, tell me about your involvement, how you got involved and what you're doing now. Oh, I got involved back in uh, about 1973, 74 when they, uh, uh, when they uh, developed the writing system. And my involvement uh, was uh, going down with the uh, linguist down uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and pronouncing the words. And uh, I guess they were uh, trying to pick out the sounds of uh, the vowels, mostly vowel sounds from the from the words that I was saying. And I got interested uh, when one of the linguists uh, who uh, had this program up at the other reservation, Dana Point, Princeton, he held a workshop here about that time, 15 years ago. Uh, he was teaching us how to read it and write it. And the course lasted about, about the summer, maybe uh, about 25 weeks, I guess, uh, two hours a week. And that's how I uh, got started uh, with the language, Passamaquoddy language. And it was easier for, for, for a native speaker to, uh, to learn the sounds of the neural writing system. And the uh, system is uh, quite simple. We will have used 17 letters of the al American alphabet and five, five, vowel, five vowels and uh, uh, 12 consonants. Within the, uh, the, some of the consonants have dual sounds, they have, they call, like a C. It, it sounds like a ch, like church. Or a ja, j, j sound. A k could sound like a g. Uh, t like a d, and so on. This is why we uh, they cut the uh, uh, cut the alphabet to seventeen letters. It was. Uh, yeah. No, this is good. Yeah. Can I just get you? I'm going to have to have you look this way now. Just stand this yes. way. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. A little bit too much reflection <laughs> in the glasses. That's good. Right here. Okay. Yeah. And well, back. I guess back this way a little bit more. A little bit more. Okay. Good. I just wanted to get some different mm -hmm. pictures in the background. Yeah. Okay. Um. Tell me. Um. Why you think it is so important to teach other people the language? Well, as uh, Joe Nicholas uh, said, it's uh, the language is, is our culture. Uh, and you can't call yourself a Passamaquoddy or any other Indian uh, unless you know your language fluently. See, all these years we, we've been, uh, it's been handed down orally. Or, I don't know how many years, 200 years maybe. And it was kept alive through the, uh, as Joe was saying, through the elders, listening to the elders. And the language is so set up that uh, if we uh, uh, 
miss, miss say a word, we'll be corrected right off from our elders. Due to the fact that the, uh, I found out when I start uh, learning the grammar of the language, the, uh, the language was the, uh, it was a, it was a split, split language. The, you know, there were two genders, uh, animate and inanimate genders throughout our whole language. So in a lot of cases, we have two words for one English word, verb. So sometimes we, uh, uh, we mix the genders, you know, what we were saying when we were growing up, and we were corrected right off. You have the genders have to match, like animate noun versus the animate verb has to match. And I don't know how it's set up this way, but I understand the uh, Maliseet language is set up the same way, uh, Penobscot language is set up the same way, and the Mi'kmaq language, they, their language is uh, uh, split into genders. And well, since that time, I've been able to uh, write anything, translate anything from the English language to our, our, our own. And it's very difficult to translate on account of the makeup of our language, the way the, the, way the genders. Like, like if I said, uh, there's one, well anyway, I was going to say, uh, our, our, the grammar of the language, we have uh, nouns, pronouns, verbs. It's a verbal language. We have no adjectives or adverbs or all the uh, preverbs are very important. They, uh, they, uh, we have thousands of them. And they are placed in front of the verb that. high schools going on for further training if we're going to fuel would be the language and knowing themselves how to uh, get along with other people, to, uh, not to be prejudiced, and try to live uh, in both worlds, uh, Indian world and the white world, because uh, the white wall is very powerful. It is, I don't know what the word, enveloping us <laughs> uh, very slowly. It's, it's, it almost eliminated our language. And if you, if uh, my uh, grandchildren or my children could be uh, shown how to live in both worlds. Uh, they would be picking out the cultures, the, the good parts of each culture. The Indian culture and the in English culture through uh, uh, mingling with the, uh, with the opposite culture, the English which they're doing right now, and also keeping up their language, which is the, uh, I think, the uh, is, uh, language is culture, and it's an uh, identifying factor that uh, we are Indian, American Indian. 
And the other thing uh, was Joe's, uh, listen to Joe, uh, is to share, share your, uh, anything of belongings, you were uh, not to uh, down anybody, you know, give a helping hand to everybody. And that, that, that used to be a very, uh, uh, I remember it was a culture to us, so to share things. As I was growing up, uh, the families, uh, the tribe, the reservation was united all the time. We were all very poor. But when you wanted to, uh, uh, we don't go over to the next house to uh, beg for, like if you're lacking sugar or tea, whatever, salt. We exchange for a little teaspoon of sugar for a teaspoon of tea, and that's how we survived. Uh, we uh, helped each other out. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I just, I'll just say, in conclusion, okay. I like to say. Yes. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, after hearing. Mr. Francis described the language. I want to be able to say Aptij Namio Gidima Jaha I am leaving. I'll see you again. Because in our past Macquarie Indian language there is no way that we can say goodbye because we know we shall meet again. Wolewan, thank you. Okay, let me point out, uh, the kids, this is uh, what the reservation that you're living on looked like about 35 years ago. Now, you can see the changes now taking place. Here are some of the substandard homes that the, our uh, grandparents lived in at that particular time. A lot of changes have developed since the lands claim. We've got new houses. But I, the reason I took you back here is to be able to... Uh, tell you even further than that. And when we go back, we point out the Indian chiefs. Remember the governor that we selected in the last election? He played the part of the governor. He was governor at that particular time back in the 20s. His name is uh, William Neptune. And this is his wife, Margaret. Now, Francis Richards, who just died recently, that's Francis Richards' mother and father, or Susie May. And Susie May now is in the 80s, right? Now, uh, moving right along, we tell about the, the soldiers that served in World War I. And uh, they are being greeted here by their grandparents. Uh, some of the soldiers are from here, some of them from nearby Eastport. Uh, I didn't serve in World War I, but my grandmother shows up in here, and my brother. A lot of these people myself. And we all have only one uh, soldier from World War I that's still living. He's a Passamaquoddy. He is now a resident of a nursing home in Old Town, Maine. Now, if we go a little further. Okay, what I need you to do is to keep talking about that again. This one? I'm still looking for another angle on that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, as we, as we talked before, the, uh, the Indians that served in World War I they volunteered for their service duty, uh, as did other soldiers in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. 
But did you know that the Indians were not allowed to vote in this state until in the mid-1950s?